Welcome to our tuned in viewers. Thank you for joining us for another iteration of the Irvine Gateway Experts Open for Business webinar series, an initiative developed to introduce foreign direct investors to our Irvine Gateway partners who are ready and willing to answer the most commonly asked questions when considering expansion to Irvine. One of the number one concerns that companies express in preparing for expansion regard navigating the US Food and Drug Administration. We were incredibly fortuitous to meet today's Irvine Gateway expert, Shep Bentley of Bentley Biomedical Consulting, who has been an absolute asset to helping companies in our pipeline access the US market legally. In this webinar, Shep will advise viewers on how to prioritize their time and resources to best seek FDA approval. So, so this is um, basically my sketch that indicates that I've been talking to the Food and Drug Administration for a little too long. Um, basically, I'm a regulatory affairs consultant uh, that has been specializing uh, in uh, medical devices for most of the last uh, 30 years. Uh, I, I got my start actually in the pharmaceutical industry, so I, I look at that as having been a good biotech grounding for uh, expanding into the rest of medtech, which is biomedical devices and software development, uh, specifying digital healthcare products and uh, helping design all classes of medical devices, class one, class two, we don't have A and B in the United States, and, uh, and class three, the most significant risk devices. Um, often these firms are in the, in the European Union and the United Kingdom, and we're talking about two different places now, <laughs> um, and seeking to expand their markets to include the United States. Basically, I like to say that I, I write a submission in front of the FDA from the blank page which essentially means if you provide me the information, I'll take care of the, the entire effort. Um, I'm not looking over your shoulder to support uh, the development of a submission. I'm, I'm pleased to be the author and to submit that to my friends at the Food and Drug Administration. A lot of times people will say, do you work with the FDA? I like to say I work with people who work at the FDA. And basically uh, the uh, submissions are for new and improved products and technologies that support them. Um, I also like to support the preclinical and the clinical development that goes into uh, the development of a competitive submission following the principles of what we call the least burdensome approach, which means essentially not making it more difficult than it needs to be for all concerned to understand uh, the safety, effectiveness, and usability of the medical technology involved. Uh, furthermore, I develop and implement uh, the uh, design and process risk management systems to satisfy regulatory requirements. Uh, th those are ever evolving. And I would say that between the European Union and the United States, they have, they have co-developed, but they've definitely taken on, uh, I would say, um, characteristics of each. Uh, so there's a European characteristic and, a, and an American set of characteristics in terms of how to approach risk management. Um, each are, are, they're similar, but they have uniquenesses that I, well, I, I represent in front of the FDA uh, for each sponsor. I'm bringing 36 years of my own experience in medical industry, 16 of which have been as an independent consultant. So you're interested in entering American med tech. And I can say without uh, any hesitation that I find that to be uh, an obviously good idea. Um, globally, the, the value of the med tech market in the world by 2025 is estimated to be uh, something on the order of $432.6 billion based on a source that I just was reviewing yesterday. Uh, by 2023, uh, the US will be 200 billion of that in med tech. That is in, in uh, Comparison to pharmaceuticals, uh, that's about half of the of the entire pharmatech market. So medtech is is expanding in double digit growth, and in the United States, pandemic or no, I see this as being an opportunity to uh, to expand and innovate. Submitting to the FDA, I want to take this discussion that we're about to embark upon here through the following sequence, basically talking about submissions because submitting to the FDA is a unique experience. Um, I find as I submit to other regulatory agencies around the world that um, there are more shared characteristics in those submissions than there are in submitting to the FDA. So we're gonna to focus today on submitting to the FDA, um, what entails 
the submission what, what uh, uh, satisfies the correspondence required, um, how to handle the teleconferences, uh, what to do about foreign standards that you may have applied in developing your submission, new standards, uh, examples of, of situations that you may encounter, uh, some policy updates, and then I'm tacking on, even though this doesn't have uh, exactly to do with submitting to the FDA, the, the topic of reimbursement, because without reimbursement and an understanding of reimbursement to some extent, um, all the success in the world in front of the FDA may not bear fruit. So that's why I want to at least make mention of reimbursement. So when we're talking about submissions to the FDA, for class two, for moderate risk devices, and this is where I'm gonna focus, um, we're talking really about the 510K. Uh, there are five different flavors of this uh, thing called the 510K. And um, I'm not making short shrift of the class three devices, the significant risk devices, which is the, the pre-market approval. But I think that given that 80% of submissions in front of the FDA uh, actually, I think is now touching on 90% of submissions for devices in front of the FDA are 510Ks. Figured, let's, let's, let's start with the most important type of submission to the FDA for medical devices. So within the realm of the 510K, these five flavors, we have the traditional 510K, which is uh, broken down into the summary uh, traditional 510K or the statement traditional uh, 510K, most common of which is the summary uh, traditional 510k, basically where you're, you're bringing together all the in information into a pre-market notification document with the idea that it will um, be a, serve as a ready reference uh, as, a, as a predicate device for others in the future, but you're, you're dealing with a, uh, a submission format that allows for um, a broader understanding versus the statement where you're just basically putting across uh, detailed information in a very, very confidential manner uh, with the FDA. And others may look at that only by requiring um, uh, that the FDA uh, share that through the Freedom of Information Act. So that's the least common 510K because most people would rather um, interact on a more in a more um, acceptable manner, which is the summary traditional 510K. Uh, we also uh, include below that the traditional 510K with clinical data. Um, I believe that the traditional uh, 510K with, with clinical data can border on being like a, a pre-market approval or, or a PMA. And so I'm not really going to touch on it too much, except to say that it's really um, very similar to a PMA um, following the format of a, of a traditional summary 510K, but uh, with, with data appended that will make it more complicated to, uh, to submit. A special 510K and the abbreviated 510K, these are baby 510Ks. These take a third of the time essentially to go through, and this is only when you're not changing your indications for use, but when you're simply updating or upgrading information. Typically, you'll use the special 510K uh, to go quickly to make some minor uh, modifications to a device that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do just purely under design controls or under process controls, but where it's actually involving the use of, of something, uh, maybe a technology or, or something where, as I say, you're not changing your clinical indications for use, but you're, you're changing it to the point that it actually does require uh, the FDA to evaluate. And the same thing, essentially, with the abbreviated 510K and then going to the other extreme, which is really, I would say, as close to a PMA as you're likely to get, is the de novo 510K. The de novo 510K is a moderate risk device without a predicate device. Now, what is a predicate device? A predicate device is a comparator device that's already been evaluated by the FDA and cleared under its own 510K. If you've got something that's a moderate, risk device, moderate risk technology that you would like the FDA to evaluate, but you don't have a ready predicate, this is called a de novo 510K. You go in with the idea that you're a class three device because you don't have a predicate to come out as a class two device. So in essence, the de novo starts out with the idea that it doesn't have a predicate but it will still be able to clear as a 510K. It's a very interesting 
use of the 510k program. I don't know if anyone today has something that uh, is is of a moderate risk that has no predicate. If there's if that is the case, uh, let's talk about that. But um, the traditional summary 510k may be beneficial to you still because there are guidances that the FDA has recently released for submitting a 510k with a predicate that has technological differences. And so you're not bound to be identical or even that comparable really to the predicate. It's just to the extent that the indications for use are the same and that the technology is comparable. Okay. The traditional summary 510k, so going to the area that is um, the most common, the most trod ground of submissions in class two, um, you want to follow the sequence off to the right. Essentially, you want to make sure that you are a class two device. Um, sometimes you may discover that you um, might be a class two A or a class two B in the European Union, and yet, uh, you are not uh, a class two device in the United States. Maybe you're a class three. Um, I can tell you, for example, right now, uh, a class two B device in the European Union, as of right now, in, and literally at this moment, uh, automated uh, external defibrillators are class two B. In the United States, they're already, they're, they're at a class three. Just be careful. So make sure you, you do obtain your device classification. Alternatively, you may be a class one. Many of the uh, digital health technologies have been downregulated from class three to class one very quickly without even passing through class two. Just they were, they were class three, today they're class one for digital imaging, for digital data storage. Um, they, they're no longer requiring a pre-market approval. They don't even require a 510K. But the first order of business, as I say, obtain a device classification, read the section, a little squiggly, uh, uh, Mark that indicates that's the section within the 21 code of federal regulations or the CFR. I will not say code of federal regulations anymore. I'll just refer to the CFR. That's, you'll hear that as you're dealing with the FDA all the time. Um, determine relevant standards. Uh, relevant standards are standards that are uh, acceptable to the FDA. You don't want to be finding a standard that's uh, acceptable to you or acceptable to other markets, but is not acceptable uh, to the FDA. You want to select a predicate device, and hopefully you have a predicate device. Are you allowed to use more than one predicate device? Yes, you are allowed to use more than one predicate device. Does the FDA like it if you use more than one predicate device? Not really, but they will allow it. Um, you just want to make sure that in the next step, scheduling a pre-sub or pre-submission meeting, that you, you discuss the use of more than one predicate device to get the understanding across. And that is really important. And I will mention this again in the presentation that talking to the FDA, corresponding with the FDA early is the secret of success. You schedule the pre-submission meeting, then you meet, then you prepare the content of your submission. That includes your test reports for each standard. And when I say the report, you don't just take the report, you, you submit the entire protocol in the report, the entire document. A lot of people say, I mean, that's 175 pages. Do I need to submit 175 pages for a traditional summary 510K? Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, the risk management file, the, the hazard analyses or the failure modes effects analysis that goes with uh, your, uh, your testing, you submit that along as well. Your usability. Uh, it used to be that we only talked about safety and effectiveness, but I can say that a, a discrete uh, third term that's important is, is to think in terms of usability. So safety, effectiveness, and usability, okay? And then if you're in a software intense uh, uh, technology, you want to concern yourself with cybersecurity and demonstrate that you've addressed cybersecurity. And then you submit and you interact. You interact until you clear. This is, this is something that uh, is a fairly new attribute of interacting with the FDA is, is the, what they call the interactive approach. Uh, now that you're able to not just go back and forth with, uh, with uh, the documentation uh, control center or the documentation mail center with written correspondence, but also just talk on the phone and be able to have web access. Uh, this is something that makes the process go much more smoothly 
and also much more quickly. So talking about correspondence, the secret of success, um, you won't see this on the FDA website, but the informal correspondence, the quick call, the email, um, this is to be done when you know what you're doing, when you understand the value of the informal quick call, the email. This is something that I highly recommend and is probably uh, the most valuable in terms of understanding information because if, especially if it's telephonic, because you will hear and understand uh, within, a, within a several minute time span, so much more information than you would if you're trying to uh, schedule uh, a formal meeting. But then going forward, you inevitably will uh, find uh, that the formal meeting is, is uh, of value as well. So the pre-submission or the queue sub, because you'll get actually a queue number when you uh, formally schedule the meeting and that will relate to your specific topic. Uh, you can have an informative Q sub. That means you're just there to discuss. That's a nice meeting because there's no expectations on any part. You're not being expected to do something other than discuss your technology. They're not expected to provide answers. They're expected to listen and take notes. Now, do they just simply listen and take notes and say nothing? I've yet to see that happen. When they're in the room, when they're listening and they're at the table with you, um, or if, if we're not having face-to-face -face meetings, as, as uh, it depends on how we're gonna go forward uh, from this pandemic, but um, as they're participating with you in the QSUB, invariably you will hear them express their opinions, express their thoughts, and it's not for attribution, it's simply to, uh, to share in the understanding of the technology. It's a very good meeting to have, informative uh, QSUBs. Questions without a question mark. I like to assert uh, information and say, I'd like to confirm this as, as uh, under the topic of questions or under the heading of questions in the document, I'll say the, the sponsor would like to confirm the following about this technology. There's no question mark. It's just basically you're putting that across and it's ironic that you have a question with no question mark, but the idea is that you're trying to confirm something and not leave it open-ended. But sometimes you do, you do need to have an open-ended uh, question answered. So that's what I call the questions with question marks. And so those questions are where you do want the FDA to, to weigh in with a yes or a no or, or something where it's very simple, typically. The idea with the pre-submission is the pre-submission meeting is that you're not making your situation more complicated. You're, you're making it simpler, you're clarifying, you're, you're creating common understanding, and you're going forward. If you're going to have an investigational uh, device exemption requirement, that is to say you're gonna do some clinical trial, then you'll have a, a need for a pre-IDE meeting. I would never submit an investigational device exemption without having a pre-IDE meeting because that will improve your odds of success with your clinical plan if for no other reason than you're showing the, the proper respect to allow them to understand what your, what your plan is before you drop an investigational device exemption filing application on them. But afterwards, you want to be timely in coming back with the investigational device exemption and provide them that as, um, in, as, in as complete and correct a fashion as possible because that will be respectful. That will show that you've taken the pre-IDE meeting minutes seriously and that you've come back to them with what it is you're intending to do. Remote meetings, probably the, the situation really going forward from 2020, I mean, from these uh, days of the pandemic, I don't expect that we're gonna get back into face-to-face -face meetings uh, at the FDA. And they prefer actually the, uh, the remote meeting if, if possible, just for the fact that they can schedule them a little more quickly and um, they're more efficient for everybody. Um, they're not as, as um, uh, I should say, um, you don't achieve the level of familiarity as you would with a face-to-face -face meeting, but you know, at this in this day and age with the constraints uh, coming from the pandemic, uh, this is probably what we're gonna be dealing with. The teleconference, the one-to-one -one informal, that's really the, just the phone call for several minutes. Um, that will be very, very helpful. If to the extent that you can set that up and, and have a, a respectful but uh, uh, productive telephone conversation, the informal one-to-one -one is good. A group call, uh, a formal group call as a teleconference is also important so that you get uh, 
uh, buy-in from the entire review staff, the, the team that will be reviewing your submission. The WebEx uh, is essentially the formal group call, but it will involve slides, the opportunity for slide presentation. Uh, correspondence is basically what you do in com combination with uh, the teleconference or the WebEx, uh, where you're basically uh, recapitulating what you understood back to them with meeting minutes. Um, they'll come back with the review of your meeting minutes. Uh, if your meeting minutes uh, disagree with their recollection, they'll basically say, this is what we recall, this is what we recall from the meeting. And you are uh, essentially working with their version of the meeting minutes. Still, it's important to have those because those represent the basis of common understanding between you and the FDA. When you are in direct dialogue, I would say that there are some do's and some, and some don'ts. Um, essentially, these haven't changed in many years and they, they are basic, but people forget them sometimes. I'll just basically say the do's, the do adopt a respectful tone. The FDA is not a notified body. It's actually the FDA is a law enforcement agency. Many people don't realize that. Um, many of the people that you'll be talking to are part of the public health service. They're uniformed. They have a, a naval uh, motif uniform and they are uh, part of the, um, in, in that regard of a military organization. So adopt a respectful tone. Don't become casual. If they start to be casual, still maintain the respectful tone. Um, do assert a point for clarification, but don't ask for an opinion. Um, they are not consultants. They are there to give uh, points of clarification and that's it. Do press the meeting forward. Don't let the meeting uh, stall on, on a point. Uh, otherwise, you have only the limited time and at the end of that time, whether you've covered all your points or you haven't covered all your points, meeting's over. Do take detailed notes, but don't record the meeting. They will not appreciate the fact that somebody was recording the meeting. That's also not legal. Uh, do let the dead air hang. Don't fill the pauses with banter. If there is dead air, sometimes they're waiting. Historically, they'll be waiting for you to say something beyond what you meant to say, and then you've said it, and that's too late to take it back. So you just let the dead air hang if there is such a thing and let them uh, fill it. Do repeat the conclusions for emphasis because sometimes uh, it will be important to make sure that it's extremely clear what the conclusion is and don't assume that they agree unless they recapitulate that they, they state it back to you. Oftentimes there will be uh, multiple members with of the FDA meeting that will have multiple opinions. Each one's bringing a slightly different opinion you want to make sure that they're in agreement with your understanding by the end of the meeting to the maximum extent possible. It's not always possible, but that's the, that's the goal of the direct dialogue. Foreign standards. You'll be coming with foreign standards uh, very likely. The good thing about the foreign standards is that often they have recognition numbers and you can check very simply on the FDA website to know that these standards do have recognition numbers. And if you're used to having to work with standards um, that are only harmonized, you can work with the standards that are not harmonized to the latest revisions without having to worry about harmonized standards. Uh, you can work, in fact, you, you should be working with the latest revision standards. The FDA will prefer that you work with the latest revision standard. Standard that's been revised, that's within its grace period. If you're using it in advance of the, of the end of the grace period, that's, that's fine. Um, if you're uh, using uh, an older standard within the grace period, it could still cause some difficulty, but it will still be allowed. But you would prefer to work with the latest revision standards. The FDA rule of thumb is work with the latest revision standards. Also think about standards um, that the U.S. releases that are equivalent to uh, non-U.S. standards. For example, the AMI standards, which are virtually identical to the, uh, the IEC standards or the ISO standards. A Amy ANSI standards, the American, um, or sorry, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation um, will be releasing standards that are virtually identical to the ISO or IEC standards typically. And then those are the standards that don't even require recognition number often. And they're just uh, cited because they're US standards. 
and then standards where no other standard exists. If there is a standard where no other standard exists, um, that's certainly better than um, having to be um, hobbled by the fact that there's no uh, no standard whatsoever to help you with the, your outputs, your outcomes for uh, testing or whatnot. If there's if there's a, a standard, it's not recognized, but there's no other standard, you can still in the pre-submission meeting discuss that with the FDA. And um, I would say that the, the likelihood is that they would uh, prefer to see that. New standards. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that new international standards, the ISOs, the IEC standards uh, with a recognition number, um, along with the new U.S. standards, the, uh, the AMI, the AIM, the ANSI, the ASTM standards um, are what we want to submit with. Um, and don't forget FDA guidance. By the way, guidance sounds like, you know, like it's a suggestion. Well, actually, it's way stronger than a suggestion. Um, there are draft guidances and then there are fi final rule guidances. That means guidances that have been adopted after the, the draft uh, review period is over. However, <clears throat> even as a draft guidance, it does represent agency thinking. And while it's not a hard and fast requirement to use the guidance, uh, it could be perceived by the FDA as insulting if you were aware of the guidance and didn't use it or thought you knew better than the guidance. So that's something that you can discuss in a pre-submission meeting. However, it is also uh, as a, as a rule of thumb, something that you would like to use. Examples of submission challenges. I just wanna mention that um, when we're dealing with uh, submissions, oftentimes people think they know better than the review staff. Um, they will put across a user manual that is not complete. Um, it is, is something that uh, they think, well, uh, anybody that looks at this little cartoon sequence will be able to understand exactly what it is that uh, I'm trying to get across. And it looks like a quick start guide, or it looks like a, uh, something that is designed to be uh, short and sweet, but it will be considered incomplete. The user manual in the FDA language is referred to as labeling the instructions for use. That is your battleground with the FDA. That is, that is where the submission succeeds or fails in terms of being acceptable, how you express the desired effect of the intended use of your device, of your technology. If it's incomplete, um, you, you don't have a, really a leg to stand on uh, in getting the 510K to clear. The software testing may be inadequate. The United States still focuses very, very heavily on software validation. Take a hard look at the software validation requirements. There are multiple guidances and standards for doing software testing. And you want to make sure that software, to the extent that software applies to your, your technology, is adequately addressed for the FDA. The risk management is unbalanced. If it's, un, if it's, if it's simply done as a, um, as a pencil exercise and it's not done uh, thoroughly, uh, the FDA will take issue with, the, with inadequate or unbalanced risk management. Now, they, they, they don't get to weigh in on saying, well, you, you should have said that that was severe instead of moderate, or that was uh, moderate instead of severe, um, more likely you would have, you know, you might have um, uh, made it a lighter outcome or a lighter severity. But the thing is, uh, they do look at the fact that it wasn't um, across all of the attributes that you should be addressing in your risk management. The materials analysis is insufficient. You definitely want to look at uh, the materials from the standpoint of biocompatibility, toxicology, uh, the FDA is still very focused on making sure that uh, the application of the ISO 10993-1, the, the latest version, which came out in September of 2018, is applied thoroughly, and you apply the, the risk management approach in the, in the way that they accept, and that can be discussed also in a pre-submission meeting. Usability evaluation is not complete, that you have not checked or confirmed or validated usability. Usability uh, is certainly uh, more important than it's ever been, and I don't see that that will go away. Usability by the public, if it's a public uh, access device, usability by clinically trained professionals, usability by um, uh, both, uh, to the extent that that is applicable, but usability 
uh, in terms of whoever is supposed to be operating the equipment, whoever is supposed to have access to the equipment, that they can understand how to safely and effectively use the product. And that the substantial equivalence rationale is light. This is a unique to the FDA uh, requirement that you demonstrate substantial equivalence by doing a substantial equivalence rationale. People think substantial equivalence means identicality. Sometimes it does not. It just means that the product that you're sponsoring versus the product that you're comparing to have substantial equivalence, that there is, there are comparators and contrastors. You are comparing and contrasting in a way that demonstrates that there are no new risks of safety or effectiveness or usability with your device that you're trying to get cleared. That's really the substantial equivalence rationale uh, in an extreme summary level, but at the same time, the substantial equivalence rationale needs to be very thoroughly thought through, and, and it needs to be a very circumspect section where you're looking at it from all sides to make sure that you're not uh, treating it too lightly. So policy updates for the FDA. Fortunately, the FDA website itself has gone through uh, an updating and upgrading, and it's a very good site to go to. Uh, it's easier to navigate than it's ever been. And if you go into the medical devices tab, the information is, is well laid out. There's redundant locations. You can, you can approach it from a variety of different ways. It used to just be that you could only reach it uh, through a sort of an arcane set of links, but now you can, you can reach it a variety of ways. We've made it very user friendly. But what I'd like to do is, is uh, cover a few of the most important uh, policies right now. The fact that the FDA is supporting the 21st Century Cures Act, which means uh, the opportunity for review and evaluation of new technologies in a very uh, effective uh, review program, uh, one of which is the Breakthrough Devices uh, designation um, for life-saving technology and, and disability uh, relieving uh, technology. So this, the Breakthrough Device designation as part of the 21st Century Cures Act is an amazing opportunity to go quickly through the uh, review process. The acceptance of 510K paperless submissions, finally. Um, you won't see that uh, on the FDA website, but if you're submitting a 510K with the understanding that you have to go in with a couple of paper documents and you have to go uh, to the printer and, and have all this ready to go uh, fully bound, you don't. You basically, the only thing you print is the cover sheet and submit a thumb drive or, or CD or however you want to submit it as an electronic, as an e-copy. It's not an e-submission yet, but it's a lot better than having to go and, and uh, print out a few reams of, uh, of paper. Substantial equivalence for devices with technological differences. This is now expanded and codified in guidance that's been out now for the last few years. Uh, the uh, substantial equivalence is, is more explicit in terms of what's acceptable for uh, 510K submissions. Scheduling of pre-submission meetings, mid-review meetings, and interactive review never has it been easier to interact with the review staff at the FDA. As long as you, as you follow their approach to how to set up those meetings, and if you can establish the rapport to have inter, uh, informal interaction, that's, that's now not only uh, allowable, it's actually encouraged. And the expansion of the least burdensome approach, which is even now incorporating in the last year what's called the least burdensome flag, which a sponsor can throw a least burdensome flag. They, they're, they're allowed to throw up to two least burdensome flags, which means that in the correspondence coming back from the FDA, the sponsor can look and see um, something that looks uh, other than least burdensome. It looks like they're introducing uh, hurdles or, or a higher burden than, than, than what should be the case. And the sponsor is now allowed to say, hey, I think this is not the least burdensome way of dealing with this question. And uh, I would just, I would urge caution to approach the least burdensome uh, flag throwing, but um, understand that that is an option where in the past uh, that was not an option. I promised I was gonna to touch on reimbursement in the United States. What's reimbursement? Well, in the United States, Really what we're talking about is the cost of medical devices covered by payers, that's insurance companies, um, applying a reimbursement code that may 
uh, be for the reimbursement of the product. Why do I say may be? Because they may not. Even with the code, they might not pay. But you want to know that you at least have the, the basis for, uh, for uh, obtaining reimbursement or that the, the, the person purchasing the, uh, the medical technology can be reimbursed by the insurance company. There is a code and that there's a, a, a good chance, a high likelihood of being reimbursed. Does each payer always reimburse? No. Uh, does having a reimburse, uh, reimbursement code improve the likelihood? Yes. And that alone could be the basis of, uh, of pursuing that code. The cost of the medical device that is applied as part of a treatment that is a standard of care procedure may achieve reimbursement. So does each payer always reimburse each procedure? As we know, no. Now this is a dynamic area in the United States. It's been a dynamic area since the Affordable Care Act and, and before but it's, it's really a turbulent uh, area. But at the same time, there are certain things that have proven to be true over many years and, and likely will remain true going forward in, in, in terms of, of strategy development and planning. Um, I would say that the reimbursement uh, uh, issue there is, is, is central to that. And we can have a much broader discussion about this, but this is important. Does having, well -established, does having a well-established procedure code help? Yes. And why is this important? Your device might not sell here unpaid. If, if people know that they won't be able to have a code or that they won't have a chance at getting reimbursed uh, in buying the technology, it might be a, a great technology, might be a very competitive technology, might even be competitively priced. But if it's not reimbursable in certain applications, it might actually, that might be the reason that the product would fail in the United States. But the benefits of competing here typically outweigh uh, the disadvantages. I just want to mention that bringing a product to the United States, you're bringing it really to an area that is extraordinarily competitive and getting all the more competitive in terms of digital health and in terms of, of software as a medical device, apps, uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to compete and, and uh, play a, an active role um, on, I would call, a leading stage. These are important uh, websites to be aware of. Um, at the FDA, uh, these, these sites in terms of how to classify your device, how to find a predicate, how to prepare your 510K, and how to register your company are important. For the, uh, the private uh, standards publishers, these are um, a few, these are four, there's, there's uh, many, but these are, these are the biggies, I would say. The, um, uh, the AMI, the AIM, ANSI, and the ASTM uh, sites are uh, loaded with uh, standards that are coming out with, with new standards. If you get on the, um, the mailing list, they will always update you in terms of when new standards are, are being published and uh, let you uh, stay current with uh, the most important revisions of these standards. Because as I mentioned, once a new standard is released, typically that's what the FDA would like you to use. So Shep, my first question is, how does the F sorry, does the FDA regulate software as a medical device? Yes and no, and that's a really good question because um, a lot of people think, well, um, if it's just software, that how could that possibly be um, a medical device? You know, we've always been taught in regulatory affairs, a device is something that when it rolls off the table, it goes thunk. Uh, software doesn't do that. Um, but software as a medical device, especially since the release of the 21st Century Cures Act, is in fact uh, regulated as a medical device in many cases. It depends really on your indications for use and uh, also the evaluatability um, by the FDA of, of software. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Guy, who mm -hmm. says, we have a clinical decision to support, uh, sorry, clinical decision support platform which can be applied to any clinical indication. Can we get it blanket approved for all indications? Uh, well, what, okay, it really comes down to what type of indications. If it's a life and death indication, um, that would be, you need to get those evaluated specifically. And if it's life and death, um, it could actually take you to, to class three. So you have to be um, looking at what you're doing. Now, what I've seen uh, in terms of, of helping get a broader indication is looking for common attributes or common, uh, call it uh, preconditions of the life-threatening condition. Um, that can sometimes get you to a lower level in front of the FDA, a class two versus a class three. Um, but being able to uh, go after, being able 
being able to pursue a discrete life-threatening uh, condition uh, will typically be uh, a class three. Okay. My third question is, does the FDA have any particular requirements surrounding cybersecurity? Yes, so basically um, what you wanna do with cybersecurity is enter into what the FDA calls its pre-cert program. And the pre-cert program applies uh, some of the standard, the most current standards, one of which is the Amy PIR 57. Uh, the most current version is the 2016 version, Principles for Medical Device Security uh, Risk Management. And if you apply that and you work with the pre-cert program, you can, uh, you can assure yourself that the cybersecurity is at least acceptable to the FDA before you have to go for a full submission. Um, on behalf of the chamber, and our companies that are live streaming or watching after the fact, thank you for your time and your keen advice. Um, I'd like to invite our viewers to reach out to you directly if they have any subsequent questions about seeking FDA approval. Otherwise, everyone, if you're ready to take the next steps to expand to Irvine Southern California, please reach out to Linda DeMario, EVP of the Greater Irvine Chamber at the listed email. We're here as a resource and an ally for you in your expansion process and connect, can connect you with the experts, partners, and resources you need. So don't hesitate to send us a quick email.